Good morning. Welcome. Those of you worshiping with us online, to those of you here, I hope you're all feeling very well rested after an extra hour of sleep, and that means you're extra ready uh, to spend some time in the Word of, of God today, and I'm very happy to share in this moment with you. I have a question for you as we begin. Have you ever prayed for something so hard and then it happened? Now we know that God answers prayers and we know that sometimes his answer is not what we hope it will be, but have you ever prayed so hard and then the answer was yes? I think about that moment, if you've been blessed to have that moment, or if you haven't, or if something doesn't immediately come to mind, like, think about what that would be like. What does it feel like? What do you do next if the answer to your bottom of your heart, like, prayed until it hurts prayer, is Yes. That's how the Gospel of Luke begins. It's really like no other Gospel in that way. Uh, the Gospel of John begins with the creation of the world. The Gospel of Matthew begins with the lineage of a king. By the end of verse 1 of Mark, we are very clearly shown that this is about someone otherworldly, someone heavenly, Jesus Christ, Son of God. But the Gospel of Luke... After a short little prologue, the Gospel of Luke begins not with creation and not with the king and not with the Son of God. Instead, it greets us with an old Jewish married couple whose names we barely hear about anywhere else in the Bible. An old Jewish married couple who prayed and God said, yes, finally. God said yes. And what does that feel like? And what happens next? Let's take a look. This is Luke chapter 1, beginning in verse 5. Here we meet our married couple. In the days of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah of the division of Abijah. And he had a wife from the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth, and they were both righteous before God, walking blamelessly in all of the commandments of the Lord and the statutes of the Lord, but they had no child because Elizabeth was barren and both were advanced in years. So here we have the start of the gospel story and we meet Zechariah and we meet Elizabeth, husband and wife. Righteous and blameless, uh, obedient and active in serving the Lord, but there is one thing they have desired, desired, but not received, a child of their own. Verse 7 says, they had no child and both were advanced in years. And while you and I know now that that is nothing to be ashamed of, the first century world in the days of King Herod of Judea is a different kind of place. And Elizabeth, in her own words, just a few verses later, is going to say, that's exactly how I felt, ashamed. Uh, some in that era viewed childlessness as a punishment for sin. This is a different time. And I want to point out that verse 6 refutes that vigorously. It says, uh, Zechariah and Elizabeth were righteous and blameless. They were obedient and active in serving the Lord. In other words, sin and punishment ain't got nothing to do with it. But that doesn't make it any easier on Zechariah and Elizabeth. And in verse 25, Elizabeth's own words for what she's experienced, having not born a child, is that it has been my disgrace among the people. That's what she says which is really is touching and sad, what she feels in her heart. But something's about to change. Verse 8, 
Now, while he, Zechariah, was serving as priest before God when his division was on duty, according to the custom of the priesthood, he was chosen by lot to enter the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And if you're like me, that's a sentence that needs a little unpacking. So Zechariah is a priest. We learned that in verse 5. He's a priest of the division of Abijah. Uh, Verse 5 said, and and what we need to know is that there are 24 little sections or groups of priests. And they might live anywhere throughout Judea, not necessarily in Jerusalem. And during non-festival times, twice a year, they would serve in a rotation, serving one week at a time at the temple and performing those duties. So for Zechariah, that means during non-festival times, there would be one week during the first half of the year, and there would be one week during the second half of the year where he would pack up his bags and he would go to Jerusalem and he would serve in his duties in the temple throughout that week. So that's what verse 8 is saying. It's saying this was Zechariah's week, his week to serve. And verse 9 is saying this is what his task was. He was chosen to enter the temple of the Lord to burn incense, which means that Zechariah is going to go into the holy place. Not the holiest place, the holy of holies. That's for the high priest only and that once a year, and it's curtained off so nobody can enter it. But Zechariah is about to go as close to that place in temple terms As anybody who's not the high priest can go, he is called to go inside, to draw near to the place where God's presence is said to dwell. Meanwhile, verse 10, as Zechariah goes inside, there's a whole multitude of people who were praying outside at the very same time, at that very same hour. And then it happens. Verse 11, there appeared to Zechariah an angel of the Lord standing at the right side of the altar of incense. And Zechariah was troubled when he saw him and fear fell upon him. But the angel of the Lord said to him, do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard. And your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John, and you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great before the Lord. Don't be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard. And the answer to your prayer This prayer that presumably Zechariah and Elizabeth, advanced in years, have prayed many, many times. The answer to your prayer is yes. Now, earlier I asked you, have you ever really prayed for something and then it happened? Like, have you prayed really hard about something and the answer was yes? And what did that feel like? What do you think this feels like for Zechariah? What would you do if you were Zechariah in this moment? Because that's exactly the situation that he's in. He's prayed for this good thing to happen. And time has passed. And now the angel is there and he says, it's happening. But there's just one problem. We might call it one prayer problem that may be more common than we think. Zechariah has prayed. And yet somehow, the answer, yes, is not something that he's ready to hear Zechariah is not prepared for yes. It's something that he does not expect when he gets it. Or worse, it's something that he did not believe when he gets it. He's prayed. His prayer is heard. 
But what happens next? So verse 13, the, the angel said, don't be afraid. Your prayer has been heard. And your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son. The next four verses are talking about how much joy that should bring and how great this son is going to be because this son is going to be John the Baptist. And then in verse 18, it's Zachariah's turn to respond to this news. And here he goes. He says, how shall I know this? How shall I know this? For I am an old man and my wife is advanced in years. How shall I know this? The NIV says, how can I be sure of this? That's Zechariah's response. Can you blame him? I have a very hard time blaming him for that response. I mean, for one, it's already been established that for Zechariah and Elizabeth to have a child at this point would be nothing short of a miracle. And and Zechariah knows this. He says, I'm an old man. My wife has advanced in years. So how can this be? How can I know this? And besides that, when he responds with those very words, he's in pretty good company. Almost word for word, this is what a fellow named Abraham said when God reminded Abraham of this promise he made long ago to Abraham that he would inherit this great promised land. Abraham says, How am I to know that this is really going to happen? And then a few chapters later, when uh, Abraham gets similar news to Zechariah, that he, in his old age, is going to have a child, Abraham fell on his face and laughed at that. And he said, shall a child be born to me, a a man 100 years old? Zechariah's in pretty good company here. Responding as he does, what would you do? What would I do? And yet, while Zechariah's response is more than understandable, is it faithful? And while I would certainly not blame him for responding the way he does, does it come from a place of trust? Because the angel in the room is not really getting the, the joke. Verse 19, the angel answered him. Zechariah says, how shall I know? The angel says, I'm Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God. Like you think you're standing in the presence of God right now. Nothing like where I stand. I'm Gabriel. I was sent to speak to you and to bring this good news. And you're asking, how can I know Can God give you any more reason to know than someone sent from his very throne room with a message straight from them? How can I know? Well, you've prayed for this, haven't you? So, behold, you will be silent and unable to speak until the day that these things take place because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their time. And the people were waiting for Zechariah, and they were wondering at his delay in the temple. And when he came out, he was unable to speak to them. And they realized that he had seen a vision in the temple. And he kept making signs to them, but he remained mute. And when his time of service was ended, he went to his home. And after these days, his wife Elizabeth conceived. And for five months, she kept herself hidden, saying, Thus the Lord has done for me in the days in which he looked upon me to take away my reproach, my disgrace among the people. There's a passage with some twists and turns. What can we learn from a story like this one? I wonder if it's something about prayer, something I find kind of convicting. Now, I'll be the first to tell you I don't have all the answers when it comes to prayer prayer, but scripture and practice and learning from others have given me some things that I hold true about prayer that I think many of you will wholeheartedly agree with. Truths like this, prayer is powerful, you agree with that? And it makes a difference. And when we pray, it shapes us, and God really listens. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayer. 
Prayer is powerful. God really listens. And not only does God listen, but God answers prayer. Uh, You might even go so far as to say God always answers prayer. Now, sometimes that answer is no, like when Jesus was praying in the garden that the cup might pass from him, and the cup does not pass from him. What he asked for, he does not receive. Or when Paul, in one of his letters, prays that that thorn could be removed from his side, but the thorn is not removed from his side. What he asked for, he did not get. Sometimes the answer is no. Other times the answer is slow, or uh, it's not all in our timing. Like sometimes the answer might be not yet, or maybe it's there and we just can't see it yet. We know that the Lord is not slow to fulfill his promises, but we also know that we have an eternal God, and, and one day to the Lord is as if a thousand years, and a thousand years to the Lord as, as one day, and, and God has his timing of things. And sometimes we might want an answer like tomorrow or now, and maybe we don't get that. Maybe the answer is not yet. Would you agree with me so far in the truth of these statements? I don't claim to have all the answers, but I do think these things are scriptural, and I think that they are true. And not only are they true, but they're important, right? Like, they, it really matters that we internalize these and hold on to these things, because without them, you know, what does prayer become? We might delude ourselves into thinking that it's just a list of demands for God to uh, fulfill for us rather than a humble request, right? We might think that by praying, we could just manipulate God, and just because we prayed for it, God now has to rubber stamp our plans and make it so. Not so. We have to remember that sometimes the answer is no. Sometimes the answer is not yet. And if we don't really internalize those things, then we could have a long road of disappointment ahead of us to not know these things. But maybe, like Zechariah, we're actually really good at these things. Maybe we are very capable at remembering the answer could be no or not yet, guarding ourselves in that way, couching our concerns in disclaimers, wrapping up our prayers in bubble wrap, when maybe we need to remember this truth also. Sometimes the answer God gives is yes. And what does it say to God if we pray and pray and pray, but our hearts are closed to the possibility even that he might give us what we ask for? Like, if we're going to ask God and ask in faith, I'm not saying we should forget that the answer could be no. I'm not saying we should forget that it could be not yet. I'm saying that we should also make room in our hearts for the possibility of God's generosity. After all, This is the God who, as Romans says, is for us and not against us. This is the God who works for the good of those who love him. This is the God who, his very spirit, hears our prayers when we don't even have the words to pray them. This is the God who helps us in our weakness. This is the God who calls us to hope in things we do not yet see. This is the God who in Ephesians, we're told, is able to do immeasurably more than we ask or imagine. And isn't that an awesome thought? More than we ask, more than we imagine. 
This is the God who, as Matthew says, knows how to give good gifts to his children, like more than a heaven, or an earthly father or an earthly mother knows how to do. This is the God who in Malachi says, test me in this and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. That is the God to whom we pray. And we believe that prayer is powerful. We are right to remember that it's his will, not ours, that will be done. And it might be no, and it might be not yet. But what a shame it would be if the answer is yes to our heart's desire, like our deepest prayer. And that answer should come and find us unprepared to receive it. Like Zechariah, your prayer has been heard. It's yes. Let's not let yes be a completely unexpected answer to the prayers that we pray. Let's pray with the proper mixture of submission and patience but also hope and trust. Let's remember the God to whom we pray. I'll close with this this morning. Today we began the the Gospel of Luke. And as I mentioned, it it begins with the story, unlike any other gospel, begins with this uh, married couple who has long been praying and God hears their prayer and they receive this unexpected gift that trades out the disgrace that Elizabeth herself feels for exceedingly great joy. That is not like any other gospel's beginning. But at the same time, it tells us where this story is going. Zechariah and Elizabeth are the people of Israel. Zechariah and Elizabeth are the world today in many ways. People waiting and longing for their pain and disgrace to be turned into joy. And in the days of Herod, king of Judea, the people of Israel have been waiting for literally centuries for a Messiah to be born to them. Hundreds of years they have waited. Think about the countless number of prayers that have been prayed and prayed and prayed. But when Jesus finally comes, when the moment finally comes, will they be ready to receive the yes that God has given them to their prayers? And when the good news sounds forth from the empty tomb and into the hearts and lives of people all around the world, even today, like people like you and me, people who bear in our hearts our own pain because of sin and our own struggles, will we be ready to receive God's yes with a yes of our own? God has been generous to his children. He answered the prayer that we couldn't form into words in the person of Jesus Christ, which is the deepest longing and need of our hearts. The question is, will we respond to his yes with a yes of our own? Yes, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Yes, I am ready to repent of my sins and turn to him. Yes, I'm ready to be baptized and washed in his blood, washed clean, be born again, be born anew. Yes, I'm ready to pray and open my heart to the yeses God may bring into my life. However you may be called or challenged by this message, let's respond to God's generosity 
while we stand, while we sing.